uh, regulating star formation in galaxies. Excellent. So um, it's a great pleasure to be able to be here. I wanted to tell you about work that um, has been done by, by myself and primarily by a graduate student, Brian Tarazis, at the University of Michigan along with a group of our collaborators trying to understand how supermassive black holes uh, act within a kind of galactic context. Um, just that we'll start with a vote. It's late in the afternoon. Who has seen uh, Andrew Ponson's This is a Galaxy video? You seen it? Oh, really not many. You guys have to go Google it, but not all at once. Don't, don't do it right now, <laughs> right? But do watch it later on. Because he, he tells us kind of this is a galaxy. It's a simulated a galaxy, of course, because he doesn't do real ones. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but so I'm going to start with a, this, this is a galaxy. Actually, I'll start with a, this is not a galaxy, right? So I don't, when I think of galaxies, I try to, I try to realize that galaxies really aren't this, right? They're not a gravitationally bound system of stars, stellar remnants, interstellar gas, dust, and dark matter. I mean, they are kind of, which is fine, but I think this misses the point. For me, galaxies are self-gravitating dark matter halos with this, enormous multi-phase warm hot envelope of gas and I mean it, it, unless you're a deeply stripped satellite in which case fine but then you have a few stars that you manage to form in the middle and maybe a supermassive black hole right and so when you do this you're kind of missing the point of the galaxy formation really is the story of what happens with the hot gas envelope around galaxies Right. So just to, to rephrase it, really the story of galaxy formation is the story of what does, what happens in the center of the halo to keep the rest of the halo afloat, to keep the rest of the halo in business. Um, and at some level we actually kind of think that way already. So, um, you know, for, we're used to the idea of a stellar main sequence where you have this envelope which has a weight which you uh, need to support with thermal pressure. And that thermal pressure, you know, the gas cools, so you have to offset it by making energy in the core of the star. Um, Sandy Faber and Kai Nuska uh, popularized the idea of a, of a star formation main sequence for, for galaxies, which at some level is kind of the same thing. I have the weight of the envelope where I'm supporting that against collapse by stellar feedback. Right. And I think we've all kind of at least implicitly bought into that kind of scheme. And then we, have, of course, have the interesting questions of, well, there are these post-main sequence central galaxies, right? These, these quiescent central galaxies where the source of support against collapse, I mean, you see the X-ray luminosities from these things. They're still cooling. They're still trying to collapse. But you offset that by support, by giving it energy from another source. And so we spend a lot of time arguing about that other source of support. Is it AGN, AGN feedback? Um, is it... You know, something to do with the stellar mass, stellar mass quenching. Is it something to do with a halo mass uh, going over a, a critical halo mass threshold? Is it morphological quenching? The problem is quiescence correlates with all of these properties. And we, I can spend a while talking about it, but lots of speakers did that earlier, so I won't bother. Um, what I want to do um, right now is to address feedback from black holes explicitly. This seems like one of the quite hopeful looking ideas. And so I wanted to understand when, when trying to test AGN feedback, how can I approach the problem uh, most, ex or, you know, most explicitly? Um, when I am approached with this kind of problem, it's always nice to start with models. And so what I have here is four reasonably successful um, models of galaxy formation. And they do all do a reasonably good job of attempting to um, describe the overall demographics of what galaxies look like. Uh, so they have the mass function approximately correct. They have some red galaxies, some blue galaxies, etc. Uh, this is the simulatic model, Enriquez et al. This is illustrious. This is Eagle. And then this is the Cataneo et al. model, which I include here specifically because it isn't, um, or star formation isn't, shut off by AGN feedback as much as uh, by gas go or by the halo going across a critical halo mass threshold. And so what I wanted to see is, hey, does the distribution of quiescent and star forming galaxies tell us anything interesting uh, about the physics of what shuts off star formation in these models? Um, so this is black hole mass against halo mass. 
for these models, and then black hole mass against um, uh, stellar mass. So the funny thing, of course, is that you know this is a black hole, this is dark matter. So you're kind of stuck. It's actually remarkable you can even think about this. This is kind of observable, which is actually kind of interesting. Um, and so what we can see in all of these planes is that the distribution of quiescent and star-forming galaxies is different from model to model. It's sensitive to how the star formation is shut off. So in these two models, even though you quantitatively have different distributions, the quiescent galaxies are quite separated from the star-forming ones. These two have long-lived radio mode maintenance feedback. This one is just a whole bunch of quasars going off, just like boom, 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 to try and keep the gas out. Uh, and you can see that the blue galaxies, in, you, know, you need a big, like, big black hole, but they're kind of intermixed. And then here, you actually have massive halos for the most part, and therefore massive stellar mass. So the point is, this is a really important and interesting diagnostic plane. And the part that makes me excited about this as an observer is that it's observable now. Right? So we can actually see what galaxies look like in this plane. So um, what does that look like? Uh, current data sets. So, you know, I'm indebted to uh, a number of folks in this room and to a number of folks outside of this room for spending decades determining the, the dynamical black hole masses for, for now well over 100 uh, nearby galaxies. And so we have directly measured black hole masses. Um, and for them, you typically have stellar masses. Star formation rates are something that was rather trickier, and so we actually estimated those ourselves. Um, and so what you can do is to identify which ones are central. So here I'm just thinking about central galaxies, ones that are in the middle of my halo. If I'm a satellite, I'm not going to think about it now. Just not because it shouldn't be thought about, but because it's too complicated. Um, that's, that's for Joanna to do. She's, <laughs> she's going to be able to do complicated things. I do simple stuff. Um, so one has the, where you can estimate the stellar masses from K band 2 mass luminosities. This is actually how it's done for most local galaxies. Uh, black hole masses come from a variety of techniques as it's hard work, and so we do what we can. And then uh, star formation rate for things where you're concerned about contamination from an AGN far infrared, and it's a massive galaxy. It means it's dusty for the most part. And you also need to worry about AGN contamination. Then far infrared star formation rates are, are the best ones to, to use. So this is, this is what we've done. These are, this is the distribution of the sample on specific star formation rate versus stellar mass plane. Um, the black symbols are galaxies, are central galaxies with dynamical black hole mass estimates. Gray is a control sample of a nearby volume limited sample with the same data set. Right? So it's an apples to apples. Okay. So this is a plot we all kind of know and love and recognize. Uh, specific star formation rate against stellar mass. You see a star forming main sequence. Some galaxies of varying degrees of quiescence. What does this look like when we explicitly ask, okay, what's going on with the black holes? This is uh, something that many of you have seen before, but we don't see this as often as we should because it's, it's a ratty correlation. This is black hole mass against stellar mass. Uh, folks don't like talking about this much because it's got lots of scatter, right? So, we, you know, in the name of the game for black holes is to try and find correlations with little scatter. Um, I'm not sure why, but... Um, but, but that's what folks like to do. I like scatter, because scatter gives you dynamic range. Right? Um, so we can ask, hey, are, are, are quiescent galaxies and star-forming galaxies differently distributed on this plane, or is it just a dog's dinner? Is it a mess? Who thinks it's going to be a mess? You wouldn't be here if it were a mess. No, because I would have ruled AGN feedback out. Right? And then I'd be super duper happy because I love to rule stuff out. I'm an observer. That's why I live. But um, yeah, but I failed. Right? So, uh, so this, is the, this is the data. Right? So these are the quiescent galaxies. These are the star forming galaxies. Um, you can, if you wish, uh, draw some kind of approximate dividing line if you wish. Right? So the, the way that we're parsing this is to is to, to emphasize that central galaxies with unusually large black holes for their stellar mass 
appear to be quiescent. Right? So if I have a big black hole, I appear to be able to shut off my star formation. If I'm the same stellar mass galaxy, but you take my black hole away, I start forming stars. Okay. So uh, let's just do uh, the intellectually honest thing of just saying, hey, I should compare this with these, right? just to ask, hey, you know, what kind of models do this kind of thing? Um, quantitatively, these models are all wrong, right? Which, which is fine, right? Because models aren't supposed to be right. They're supposed to help us build intuition. Um, and so what one should do instead, I, I would argue, is to look at the distribution of reds versus blues in a relative sense. And in this case, the models where you have a clear separation between quiescent and star forming as a function of black hole mass are unusually successful in producing this kind of split. This requires, in these models, long-lived maintenance mode feedback from an AGN. Uh, models where you just have uh, a quasar going off whenever there's gas in the middle appear to just have too much intermixing of, of star forming and quiescent galaxies. You could have seen that. We, that, that could have been quite possible. And, and we don't see that. And, and we don't appear to see um, uh, a, depend, a very strong dependence on primarily stellar mass. Okay, so uh, it's interesting to ask. So I, I'm, I've been guilty um, for about the past 12 years now of selling the notion that, hey, there's you know, a red sequence. We used to call it a red sequence, and then we called it quiescent galaxies because we had a UVJ diagram instead. Um, but, you know, so I, I've red and blued here, right, which is a very um, politically relevant thing to do. But it's interesting to ask, you know, is quiescence all or nothing? So what we can do is you can take this. You, can, you have specific star formation rate, which is the axis pointing towards you. And I've just projected along it. But I can unproject it. And so what we'll do is, is a little bit of a funny exercise. So we're going to look at it instead of, um, we're going to look at it from this direction towards black hole mass. But we're actually going to look at it along this great line. You get similar answers if you look just at black hole mass or along that line. But um, this is somewhat cleaner. So this is specific star formation rate versus uh, where, you, uh, where you are across, across this line. So this is high black hole mass. So over here is high black hole mass to stellar mass ratio. Here is low black hole mass to stellar mass ratio. So I'm looking across here. This is, this is this side of the plot. This is this side of the plot. And so what one can see is that as my black hole becomes more and more prominent, quiescence becomes more and more complete. So at a low black hole mass, I'm forming stars happily. If I give myself a factor of 10 more black hole mass for Christmas, then I become somewhat quiescent. If I give myself another factor of 10 in black hole mass, I become more quiescent still, and so on and so forth. So quiescence is a continuum, right? At some level, it's an equilibrium between, um, between feedback from the, from the supermassive black hole and the rest of the halo. And so this is... Um, this is one point. The second point here is that quiescence can be partial, right? So we've all been kind of talking about Green Valley galaxies and, uh, you know, and I've been, I've been guilty of trying to lump them into two camps. But if you're in this kind of middle zone, right, there, there are galaxies that are actually there. They have a star formation rate that's a factor of five or ten below the star forming main sequence, but they're sure as hell not dead, right? And these are pictures of them. That's M81. This is M31. Um, those are partially quiescent galaxies. They're forming stars at a reduced rate. They have been doing so for giga years. We have a resolved star formation history of M31 that shows that star formation has been going on at a relatively smooth rate for four giga years. It's been going down slightly for the last four billion years. But it's, it's, it's not as if there, it fell off a cliff with a quenching event and then uh, you know, just maintained at some lower level. It's just been kind of going and getting tired. Okay. Later? What do you mean no? Well, uh, then maybe you should read the paper that has the star formation history for M31. I mean, you know, I'm on it, but I didn't do it. Um, okay, which is why I read it. I mean, that's anyway. Um, okay. When you reach a certain level of seniority, anyway. Um, okay. 
So something that got me really interested was galaxies have a wide range in black hole mass at a given stellar mass, which, you know, with hindsight was obvious, but that just, like, isn't what folks shouted about. Um, why? And um, so I wanted to think about this a little bit. And one lens I want to look at this through is the idea of, of merging. So I myself, again, for about the past 12 years, have been saying, hey, mergers are really important in making bulges. Um, and so, so fine. And, and a lot of the community agrees. Thank you. Um, so again, the good thing about this is that we actually have the ability to test this now. So uh, one particularly powerful probe of, of merging and accretion is a stellar halo. So what happens in a stellar halo, so the stellar halo is the outer stellar parts of a galaxy. Uh, what happens is it's filled basically with the tidal debris of stuff that's been, sh of either low mass galaxies that are shredded or the out outer parts of bigger galaxies that have been merged in. So if I have a little stellar halo, then I haven't merged with much during my life. If I have a nice big stellar halo, I've merged with a lot. Right? I've merged with or accreted a lot. And so it's a, it's a sensitive probe of, uh, of, the merger, of the integrated merger history of the galaxy. And it's observable. So uh, this is actually super duper hard work. We've seen a little bit of discussion of this. Uh, to my mind, the kind of gold standard way of doing this is to resolve stellar populations uh, because it allows you to reach much lower surface brightness levels in integrated light. Um, and there are about 10 or so galaxies with uh, reliable, well-resolved um, stellar population information for their halos. This is the, the famous example, M31, the pandas uh, data for that. And this is Nicolas Martin's visualization of that. Uh, we have... Um, data for six galaxies with HST along a number of sparse fields for six galaxies from, from the HST ghost survey. This is approximately to scale, which rather depresses me. Um, I mean, to physical scale. But we do end up getting, you can kind of see, if you plop these down on this, you would have uh, a measure. It would be not a perfect measure, but you would have a pretty good measure of, of what was happening in the stellar halo of that galaxy. With this kind of data, you can make uh, surface brightness profiles. So this is surface brightness as a function of, of radius for the six galaxies in our samples combined. And this gives you some kind of idea of the kind of profiles you manage to get. The typical surface brightnesses, by the time you reach 30, 40, 50, 60 kiloparsecs, is somewhere between 30 magnitudes per square second and 34 magnitudes per square second in V. Um, which is really, really, really faint. It's about a factor of, uh, it's about 11 or 12 magnitudes below sky. No, it's, it's like 14 magnitudes below sky. It's a lot, this is scary hard work. Okay, so you can take these stellar halos, right, these plus the ones that other groups have been doing, uh, and then you can plot them against things like, hey, I wonder if I can ask does the stellar halo mass, my merger history, correlate with a bulge or with a black hole? Like, am I making big bulges? Am I making black holes in mergers? Uh, this would be fun to know. So I'm going to show you the result. Okay, uh, this is the plot. This is stellar halo mass uh, along both axes against uh, dynamically measured black hole mass along here or, or the bulge mass um, along there. You can do it with bulge to total ratios and stuff. And basically, an the answer does not change. It's uh, a visualization thing. What's happening here is you go towards more intense merging and accretion as you head this way. This is, uh, so if Phil Hopkins was here, I'd blame him. Uh, so this is the Hopkins et al. Uh, binary merger um, expectation for what kind of merger ratios should give you what kind of, um, what kind of bulge mass. And so this is the kind of, this is not really a prediction, but it's indicative of what a one-to-one -one slope would look like. So you might want to move it a wee bit, but the point is galaxies should ally along something like this. And they sure as hell don't, right? Uh, there is red and black. Red is what uh, Cormody would call a pseudobulge. It's basically a low-mass bulge. Um, 
I, I don't know whether you're a pseudo-bulge believer, thank you, or not, but this is uh, what he would call it. These are what Cormody would call classical bulges. They're large, meaty, non-controversial bulges. And what one can see is that while some classical bulges, while some very massive black holes appear to be made in systems with an active merger history, some weren't. M81 has this enormous bulge, this black hole, uh, 10 to the 8 solar masses, that's, you know, that's causing the galaxy to be partially quiescent. It's suppressing the star formation of the galaxy. And it appears never to have merged. There are many galaxies with much smaller bulges and with practically no black hole in the middle that appear to have had a much more active merger history. Um, so in this, this part of the talk, I've actually unlearned something. I had kind of convinced myself of the merger story, and now I have really no idea what's going on which is good, it's good to kind of unlearn every once in a while. So just to uh, conclude, uh, the main things I wanted to communicate to you today is that there's a wide range of black hole masses at a given stellar mass. That galaxies with large black holes for their mass do tend to be quiescent. Right? The quiescent galaxies tend to live up here. Um, this is naturally reproduced in, uh, in models with maintenance mode AGN feedback. Um, Star formation can be partially suppressed, though. So it's not, quiescence is not an all or nothing thing. Like most things, it's a continuum. It's more complicated than, uh, than just kind of an on or off thing. And then finally, massive black holes and bulges appear to be formed in a diversity of ways and for those not to always involve uh, merging. Thank you. All right, questions? I guess I just have a comment about the uh, <clears throat> stellar halo stuff. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting thing to look at, but I'm not sure. I mean, you know, stellar halos are built out of little things, mostly. Uh, no, not when I've had a merger. Then I've dumped my outer parts, and I've dumped the outer parts of secondary out into the stellar halo, too, or out into what I would call a stellar halo, because right now I'm just dumping everything in a 10 to 40 kiloparsec bin into a stellar halo marked trash can. Maybe I should have said it a different way. Stellar halos can be built out of little things. Yes. And so just knowing what the stellar halo mass fraction is doesn't necessarily tell you what your major merger history was like. Uh, Another way of putting it is, yes, yes, yes. if I have a lot of gas in my thing that's falling in, <laughs> that can change things. Right. So, so I'm just saying, like, I, I agree with you at some level that measuring stellar halos tells you something about the merger history. But it doesn't necessarily tell you everything about the merger history. Totally. If you could tell me everything about the merger history, I'd be much obliged. Um, <laughs> but I, I think this is a potentially an interesting way to start because honestly, otherwise, I do not know where to start with uh, trying to measure the merger histories of individual galaxies. Um, I mean, I, I know I can go out and look at merging things and then try and intuit that they're forming bulges, etc. But this is a totally complementary archaeological way of looking at it. And at least this is not what I expected to see. I mean, I, I wouldn't have minded some scatter, but this is silly. Um, I'm not surprised. No, I'm, well, with hindsight, I'm not surprised, but I am, I, I was a wee bit surprised. I think Duncan was next, right? Yeah. So does a galaxy like M33 without, perhaps without a supermassive black hole fit into your picture here? Sure, it forms stars just fine. I mean, it, the point is, I think a little galaxy, well, I shouldn't use my finger because it's not very long. Um, so a little galaxy, nah, now, uh, what I should have done, I'm sorry, is um, I think, you know, this dashed line con continuing up is, is just foolish. Really, we know that, that the distribution needs to look like this. There are plenty of galaxies without supermassive black holes that lie in a star forming main sequence. So I think here it's telling you that these black holes are energetically unimportant in supporting my halo against collapse. And they become energetically more and more important as the black hole becomes larger and larger. But definitely, if I've got you know, just kind of a little or no black hole, I don't think my galaxy cares. I think it just supports itself with, with stellar feedback. Thanks. Can I get the long version of the no? Good, good. So I didn't mean to be rude, but. Uh... It's, it's fine. I'm not. We know each other. Um, I thought you said that this middle figure 
indicates a continuous evolution along this diagonal line? Oh, absolutely not. Okay, fine. So we don't have any agreement. Because my interpretation of this, this, this and together with the left one, it may be possible that you grow um, in stellar mass and while you're on, on the main sequence of star formation, and then at some point, when you reach some halo mass or stellar mass, you suddenly start quenching and suddenly, and suddenly start building up the black hole. In fact, we see this in simulations. And that's the blue nuggets phase when these things start. So in this diagram... You, you yourself have argued blue nuggets do not apply to most of the galaxies here, which are present. I think they did apply at, high, at earlier times. And they are more important than these the mergers not, necessarily. That's my point. That counts for one-tenth of present day. One-tenth, maybe a fifth of present day quenched things. Most quiescent things... So for example, M31 is what we really need to explain. That didn't go through a blue nugget phase. A blue nugget phase is a very short time scale. So uh, you don't see many. But every galaxy could have had it. Fine. Let us agree to disagree. Uh, can the next speaker come up if there's one, any more short questions? Edmund, do you have a qu you had a question. Should we talk about it later? Yeah, a simple one, uh, comment actually first. And that ah, very is, good. Uh, quiescence, I think, uh, in today's world, may be quite different from quiescence back in time. And so that we may want to actually discriminate between the quiescence that you were seeing today versus those back. So that the processes that are involved in causing that in relationship to black hole may also differ. And finally, uh, the other comment is that I think when you're talking about the histories and mergers, I think the angular momentum will play some role. So the things with gas, low angle momentum, things that go to the bulge, which you know very well. Mm -hmm. I think that matters more than whether a bunch of minor satellites came in and sw swarmed yeah. around the galaxy. But I, so. think, I think there is a misconception. I mean, the, the stellar halo, it's, it's not a bulletproof diagnostic, but it is, if there's stars in the thing that are emerging, many of them end up in the stellar halo. So if I have very little in the way of the stellar halo, it is a powerful statement. It places, if there's a merger involved, it places strong constraints on what it was like. Just and the point is, Uh, it actually shoots out the other side and, and sprays stars, but I, I agree. But the point is, is that we can measure it, and now we can actually talk about this using data rather than simply, you know, just kind of vaporware. All right, let's thank, let's thank Eric again.